This presentation deals with the matter of the charge of interest and its treatment in different cultures. The first culture that is important for the understanding of the ethics or the acceptability of charging interest are the ancient Hebrews. In the Christian Old Testament it is written the borrower is the slave of the lender. That's in the book of Proverbs 22.7. And what this means is that the ancient Hebrews saw the charge of interest as a form of weapon of enslavement. Now the Hebrews recognized that it was considered immoral to lend to their brother Hebrews and in Exodus 22.25 it says if you lend money to my people, that's other Hebrews, to the poor among you, you are not to act as a creditor to him, you shall not charge him interest. And so what this shows is that in the ancient Hebrew world the charge of interest was prohibited as sinful as going against the will of God when you were charging interest against other Hebrew people, against other chosen people of God in the Abrahamic tradition. But the prohibition was only extended to loans to fellow Hebrews. This is important because the Hebrews always understood that it was fair, reasonable, to charge interest on loans to non-Hebrews because they were not the people of God and it was quite reasonable to enslave them uh, as a tidier way of dealing with them as enemies. Another aspect of the economic treatment of banking and lending was debt forgiveness. There was a tradition once every 50 years of what was known as a jubilee year. In this case all debts were cancelled and so this was a tradition which I would imagine debtor Hebrews look forward to where simply debts were all wound back to zero. This had the practical effect of preventing wealth polarization amongst these ancient peoples and it fostered a form of economic independence because the tendency for wealth to concentrate in a few hands and leave the rest of the community dependent on those wealth holders uh, tended to be discouraged. The actual practice of the Jubilee year is historically in doubt. However, it stands out as at least on the rule books, so to speak, that it was an official part of Hebrew tradition. However, regardless of whether the Jubilee year was in fact celebrated, it was certainly well understood that the charge of interest amongst Hebrews was prohibited and it was to be used as a form of economic exploitation of others coming from the understanding found in Proverbs. These references by the way are only a small number of the citations in the Old Testament that prohibit the practice of charging interest. When we move to Islam which is also a religious tradition that originated from the children of Abraham we find that the charge of interest is definitely prohibited. Now this is actually consistent with Western thought where we have found that we have not been able to defend the charge of pure interest, that's the risk free real rate of interest anywhere in the Western tradition and we have also found that thinkers like Aristotle have found it to be immoral and so there is a certain consistency in the Islamic tradition of prohibiting the uh, charge of pure interest. In the Islamic tradition riba, which is the Islamic term which is normally applied to interest also includes any instance of taking more than you have a right to and this can include cases where you overcharge in buying and selling. Also places where you take extra use of things that might be loaned to you for instance than you actually have a right to. We have the quote, or one of the quotes, from the Quran where it outlines fairly clearly the prohibition on usury and the way that 
it is considered in the Islamic tradition to be definitely against the will of God. Contemporary Islamic banking has taken this position into practical application in the provision of Islamic finance where you can go to an Islamic bank practicing financial arrangements that are in conformity with the Quran, where capital is provided without interest, without riba. What happens is that the bank takes an equity position. That means that the bank provides capital, but it provides it on the base of basis of a partner, an equity position. And so because they're taking an equity position, they take a profit share or a rent share. This means that if you borrow or accept money from an Islamic bank, say to buy a house, and you have, let's say, 50% deposit, the bank actually owns half of your house. And the payment you make to the bank is the rent on half the house. And you aim over time to buy out the bank's share of the house. And so you're paying down their equity share and all the time paying the rent which is appropriate for whatever proportion of the house the bank owns. In practice the Islamic banking system was not affected by the global financial crisis. There are many reasons for this but they all tend to come down to the way that Islamic finance operates without interest and so there's no finance risk. All of the returns and risk are all located in the industry where the capital is being applied, whether that's to property or some other business venture. When we look at the borrower's perspective in Islamic finance, we find that it's quite different to borrowers in Western finance. First of all, because the payments are made as a form of rent on either the property or a profit share in the case of lending to a business, there is no finance risk. This means that the percentage of rent or profit which is paid to the bank is a function of how the property is performing or the business is performing, not how the finance markets are going. So there's absolutely no question of having the bank write to you and say that interest rates have gone up and therefore the repayment has gone up. It actually re works in the reverse, that because you're intimately associated with either the property or the business, you have a good idea beforehand what share the bank is going to be taking. This means that the risks are limited to those related to the assets and therefore there is a significantly lower risk for the borrower because the great problem in the West is where the finance markets move interest rates higher while the property markets or the business environment reduces the returns for property or business. And so the borrower is stuck in a very unpleasant sandwich where income from the asset which has been bought on borrowed funds is going down while the interest cost is going up. This is what bankrupted many people, both property investors and business borrowers in the early 90s. And to a certain extent it will be happening in places hardest hit by the GFC today. One of the advantages of Islamic finance is the finance cost is proportioned to the asset performance. And this means that while the bank will share the upside performance, in other words, if the property market is stronger than you expect, then the bank will charge you more rent and you'll have to pay more. But overall, you'll be benefiting still in that upside performance. Also, in the other direction, you are insulated by the bank from the downside risk. And so if the property market crashes or if the business world goes very quiet, the bank takes as much of a loss as you do. From the bank's perspective, it has an incentive to thoroughly assess the venture risk. And this means a very different perspective. The bank is going to be taking on the risks of whatever the funds extended are going to be applied to. This means that the bank is far more likely to apply greater caution and a higher depth of analysis to assessing to make sure that the ventures are in fact solid and viable.
What this means to the borrower is that if an Islamic financier does choose to fund a particular venture, the borrower has the additional security of knowing that the bank has viewed the venture dispassionately as highly likely to succeed. What this means is that the borrower has at least two reasons to expect a considerably lower risk than what would happen with a Western loan. That's because the borrower doesn't have any exposure to a finance risk and also because the Islamic finance provider is going to take a considerably more cautious view in terms of their analysis of the venture risk and considering the bank will most probably have far greater and more experienced resources to assess the venture risk it means that from the borrower's perspective with these two advantages in hand that the borrower will almost certainly be exposed to considerably reduced risk compared to the Western situation. There are several community implications of the Islamic finance system. The psychology of the relationship between the bank and the borrower is as a partner, part of a family or brotherhood relationship, not an adversary, not someone who is likely to close you down. Similarly, there is in practice a superior distribution of outcomes. While in the good times the borrower may not enjoy the superior upside benefits, those superior upside benefits are in fact distributed amongst the lenders into the bank as superior performance by the bank. And so the superior business performance of either a property investment or a business investment is distributed more broadly across the community. And in the converse, when things don't go according to plan, the community tends to implicitly take a form of soft insurance position where the poorer position is then spread across the community of depositors into the Islamic bank. Now this is overall consistent with Islamic themes of brotherhood in commerce and brotherhood in general. But you will find a common theme amongst most non-modern Western peoples. We find a similar set of themes in pre-modern Europe, where the sense of prominence for the community expressed in the tradition of the importance of principles in the public life directed towards the common good dominated the thinking of pre-modern Europe. That is, Europe from the end of the Roman era, about the 4th century, through to the 16th century. We find that while the 4th century to the 8th century were very difficult times, known as the Dark Ages, even through that dark and wild part of European history, the charge of interest was immoral and illegal basically from about the time of Constantine. And that prohibition as illegal and immoral continued up to the end of the 1400s, that is the end of the 15th century. The change in thinking actually began probably in the 13th century. During that time there was a practical subversion of this long-held tradition over a millennia long tradition of considering the charge of interest as immoral. In that time, bankers were setting up technical ways of charging interest, however not recording it in the contracts as interest, getting around the legal restrictions. As that tendency increased and became more commonplace, the public sentiment maintaining the legal status was weakened. And eventually, in the 1500s, under the reign of King Henry VIII, there was the permission of a legal rate of interest of 5%. It's significant because this legal rate of interest was the first time in over a thousand years that interest had been legal anywhere in Europe. Now, despite Henry VIII and eventually other European countries following suit, in allowing a legal rate of interest. There was the permission for people 
who lived in Europe who were not Christians to be able to charge interest. So this provides quite a rich landscape across Europe because while the Christians in Europe consider it immoral and illegal to charge interest, anyone who was not a Christian in Europe was permitted to act as a banker and lend to the Christian community. To a certain extent, what King Henry did was permit a greater conformity because the freedoms that were given to the non-Christians were allowed across the entire community. A curiosity of that same era was that it was relatively shortly after interest was permitted in Europe that we have the first of the long waves, the first of the significant recessions or depressions that have tended to occur through Europe about twice a century, about once every 48 or 50 years since then. These include the recent GFC, the 1930s depression and the depression of the 1890s. Because of this coincidence with regular economic cyclical breakdowns happening that began at the same time as the change in the usury laws. Some would say that when Reba entered Europe, the periodic economic breakdowns came at the same time, pretty much as an illustration of the shortcomings of a debt charging economy. When we look in the Asian traditions, we find that the thinking is not quite as crisp as is found amongst the Hebrews, the Muslims, and the pre-modern Europeans. However, there is a tendency in many Asian countries for moneylenders to be considered poorly. This is certainly evident in India and Vietnam, where there are sanctions against the lending of interest and the perception of moneylenders as being a partially dishonourable occupation, even though it is a highly lucrative one. In Vietnam, there is emphasis on alternate financing methods, especially methods which are organised more around the sense of community sharing and community using money as a way of coming together in solidarity to solve particular needs. One example of this is a system known as the Hui in Vietnam. This is where a group of people get together to work and save and they in turn take a benefit from the Hui as a form of almost a very micro scale credit union. While the rules of the Hui are fairly specific and it's not really a credit union because it doesn't charge interest, it is an example of a relatively small number of people being able to achieve quite remarkable savings outcomes or capitalisation outcomes without the use of interest. Lastly, we'll mention customary peoples. The distinctive thing about indigenous people is that their laws and customs are set by tradition. These usually go back to some sense of spirituality. When we look at the details of them, usually they are circumscribed by traditional life. That is, the customs and laws tend to be conformed to the traditions and the situations that are found in indigenous communities. There's an overall emphasis on the community as a family and the idea of treating people, regardless of what your relationship is, and this includes commercial relationships, in a sense as part of a family. And so the test for acceptability, even in the case of novel situations, is one of whether it would be an acceptable thing to do, some commercial activity or contract, would it be an acceptable thing to do to a member of one's own family, maybe a brother or a cousin. Because customary people do not use money, or at least don't have developed traditions in the use of money, the only conclusions that can be taken about the acceptability of the charge of interest have to be taken through an implicit application of the overall notions of custom that we find generally applying to Indigenous people.
What we can conclude fairly evidently is that money lending runs counter to solidarity. In other words, the relationship between a lender and a borrower is not one of mutual support, but a situation where the lender is aiming to take an income while insulating themselves against risk. And so this means that necessarily it doesn't come from a principle of solidarity. What we can see is that solidarity is a core principle in the organisation of customary people's relationships. And so for that reason we can conclude that the charge of interest is inconsistent with the principles that underlie indigenous traditions, even though we don't see explicit prohibitions in the laws and customs of particular indigenous people. In conclusion, what we can see is the examination of non-modern Western people is fairly much unanimous in coming down against the charge of interest. Historically, when interest and indebtedness has been a major issue in communities, such as in ancient Greece around the time of Aristotle, it was also coincident with the overall demise of the culture as an economic strength and to a certain extent in terms of the sense of community functioning. It may merely have been a coincidence that Greece fell to the Romans relatively shortly after Aristotle was complaining about the charge of interest, especially in the light of the money lenders who had largely caused the average Greek farmer to be largely in debt. It may have been a coincidence, or it may indirectly have been a result of community changes of which the charge of interest was only one. What we can conclude is the modern West is amongst the minority when it comes to the widespread acceptance of charging of interest. Certainly that is the case amongst traditions that have a well-developed reflective tradition.